Uh, man, does anybody else remember 2015 like it was just yesterday? <laughs> okay, so far so good. So far so good. Also, I feel like I just haven't seen a lot of you guys since last year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By the way, I, so, I said both of those at 9.30 this morning and I actually got booed. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for not going that far. You probably booed me in your hearts, but at least you didn't do it out loud. That's fine. To be honest, though, isn't like a New Year's dad joke like the best combo? New Year's dad jokes. I have a friend, Jeff, in Minnesota, and we email each other all the time. And in the new year, we always try to one-up each other with a sweet New Year's dad joke. And they're awful, terrible, and still somehow pure gold. I don't know how it happens that way. This year, my friend Jeff, uh, as he was leaving the office on the 31st, he told his boss, he said, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and take the rest of the year off. <laughs> right? It's a good one, Jeff. Bless you, Jeff, and your beautiful corny dad humor. It tickles me. I do, though, like to bring this one up every year. May all your troubles last as long as your New Year's resolutions. This one's maybe a little more nicer, not as corny. Also, though, some of you might want to boo that, so we'll see. I had a great New Year's Eve this year. I was able to do a wedding uh, for a couple in our community who planned in three weeks a surprise wedding on New Year's Eve because their family and friends were going to be in town. It was a really cool way to bring in the New Year. It was the best New Year's I've had in a long time. Probably because I'm a dad now and I go to bed at like 10 o'clock on New Year's usually. But we are here today for the purpose of celebrating who God is and what God does. And this week in particular, we celebrate Epiphany. Now, Epiphany starts on January 6th. It's part of the church calendar year. But we start celebrating it on the preceding Sunday, this Sunday. Now, Epiphany means manifestation or appearance. And it refers to the new manifestation of God to the whole world through the coming of Jesus. And the season of Epiphany lasts until Lent. And it's really great for us to start this season today. And what we're going to do today, we're actually going to walk through more of the book of Matthew. We are going to continue the story a little bit. We will follow Devin's message from last week, where he left us off with the end of the Christmas story, where the Magi find and worship Jesus. And where we'll go today, we'll talk about some dreams, some migrating, and some awful, tyrannical, fear-based murder, and a God who reveals himself through and amongst all of those things. We will walk through this story. We'll read it, and we'll stop, and we'll point out some parts that will be of interest to us, or at least to me, because I'm the one up here doing this. Then we will end with some encouraging thoughts of epiphany, and we will gather at the communion table at the end. But before we do all that, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, in these moments together, we are gathered as your children. And in this season of Epiphany, we ask that this morning you would reveal yourself to us in some way. That we would have the courage uh, to sit in this room together as family and friends and be open to who you are and what you're doing and paying attention to who you are and what you're doing and maybe what our part might be. We trust you in these moments knowing that you're good and that you are love and that you offer those things to us through relationship. We are hopeful in these moments just to catch a glimpse of who you are. Amen. So let's read. I will read it for us uh, from Matthew starting uh, verse 13 of chapter 2. When they, that is the Magi, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother dur during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. 
And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the timeline that he had learned from the Magi. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. But when Joseph heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in another dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And so what was fulfilled was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. So like I said, we pick up immediately after the Magi story from last week. An angel appears to Joseph in a dream. And we will spend more time on this in a few minutes because it's one of the most significant parts for today. But the angel tells Joseph to get out. Get to Egypt right away because Herod is going to try and find and kill Jesus. In fact, we read that Herod's rage leads him to call for the death of all boys to and under in Bethlehem and its vicinity. And we can't rush through or gloss over this part of the story. We have to notice that after all of the fanfare of the Christmas story of the last five weeks, and especially after this great story from last week of the Magi coming and meeting Jesus and hearing and seeing the good news, we have to notice that the same night, the same wonderful night that the Magi leave, this story takes on a completely different tone. Advent begins with an angel singing glory to God in the highest. Begins with hope and stars and a manger. And now the angel says, get out. Herod is going to try to kill your son. And now the savior of the world is on the run. In fact, he's a refugee in the world he came to save. It's a pretty crazy, quick turn of events. So a quick bit of context on Herod and his control of Judea at the time. Uh, historians, as I read the last couple of weeks, uh, Herod was self-appointed king of Judea after he conquered the region. And he spent his reign trying to prove to both the Jews that lived in the area and his Roman authorities that he was worthy of this position of power. And so his reign was categorized as fear and anxiety-based. He built massive fortresses. And he had a form of secret police monitoring the people to see what people actually thought of him. And his insecurity, combined with the systems and structures in place, make it not that far-fetched that he would jump to this reaction of ordering the death of all boys under two in Bethlehem and its vicinity. Again, as I studied this week, uh, historians suggest that the number of boys under two in this area described would have been around 30 or so. So not hundreds or not thousands, maybe like movies or some of the exaggerated stories would have had us believe. I know I would have thought differently. And so yes, what I'm weirdly saying is that the total number of kids that were killed may have been only 30 or so, 
which is still just awful to say in the first place. But regardless of how many, regardless of whether or not there is any consolation in a lower number, perhaps no event in the gospel challenges the sentimental Christmas story more than the death of these children. Jesus is born into a world in which children are killed and continue to be killed to protect the power of tyrants. As we said, the Messiah, the kingdom of God incarnate, is now a refugee in the world that he came to save, on the run from a tyrant who is resorting to killing children in a fit of rage. I was sent a poem that describes this tension really well, and so I'm going to read it for us this morning. We think of him as safe beneath the steeple, or cozy in a crib beside the font, but he's with a million displaced people on the long road of weariness and want. For even as we sing our final carol, his family is up and on that road, fleeing the wrath of someone else's quarrel, glancing behind and shouldering their load. And while Herod rages from his dark tower, Christ clings to Mary, fingers tightly curled. The lambs are slaughtered by the men of power and death squads spread their curse across the world. But every Herod dies and comes alone to stand before the Lamb upon the throne. Matthew's account of the death of the children of Bethlehem is stark. There isn't even an attempt to explain or justify it outside of it fitting into a prophecy. And the gospel story, the rest of it, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is not even meant as a consolation for those whose children are taken from them in this story. But rather, those who follow and worship Jesus are a challenge to those who would kill children. The Herods of this world usually begin by hating what children in general, but especially this child, Jesus, represent. Peace, love, surrender, the lack or releasing of power and control. And the systems and the politics of tyranny and murder and oppression are what the church that now worships this Jesus are called to be different than. It is love that makes the followers of Jesus an alternative to the world that fears this child. So as we go back to the story, back to the scripture that we read, after the angel speaks to Joseph, Joseph gets up and goes. If you saw, it was twice the, the line, so he got up, happened twice in that story, verses 14 and 21. Joseph doesn't hesitate. And that's an amazing and an ongoing theme for this story and for Joseph in particular. Four times in the Advent narrative, including today, an angel appears in a dream to Joseph. The angel says, go, and Joseph just goes. Throughout this narrative, even, Joseph is given the gift to trust his own dreams. Do you trust your dreams? <laughs> I have some kind of crazy ones. I would not trust them. Maybe you're more like comedian Mitch Hedberg. Who talks about his dreams. He just wants to dream a peaceful dream of watching himself sleep. But now instead, he's got to build a go-kart with his ex-landlord. <laughs> but regardless, by the end of this narrative, 
Joseph is hearing God well and responding with little to no hesitation. And with the success of the growing number of dreams and their responses, I'm thinking that Joseph relaxed into trusting the voice of that angel. If you remember, the last dream, the fourth dream, comes in correlation with some common sense that Joseph shows. Because the region might not be as stable as they think because Herod's son is now ruling. And Joseph is uneasy about that. I wonder if responding to that fourth dream was a little bit of a relief because finally that correlated to Joseph's own understanding and awareness of what was happening in the world. It's not everything that God might call us to or push us towards is out of context and without correlation to our own wisdom and awareness of our circumstances. Now as a dad, I resonate way more with this story of fleeing and running to protect my family than I do with many of the stories of fathers found in scripture. This one I resonate with well. Now, did you know that there is an entire corner of the internet dedicated to something called dad reflexes or dad saves? These are moments, uh, videos or GIFs or GIFs, however you want to say it, or vines. The people have captured where their fathers save their kids from something happening a split second before something really bad happens. There's tons of them, and I found one that I wanted to show you. This is a classic, and so we'll let this run a few times. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. I'll let it go a little bit. We'll get it out of our system. Now, I'm not sure who made the call to send the kids down a hill this size in one of these awful, tiny, wheeled little Fisher Price cars. It's probably the same dad, if I know anything about myself or other dads. I think actually it is the same dad. Yellow shirt, blue jeans. Yellow shirt, blue jeans. Same dad. And if you look even closer, at the start of the clip, there's another dad just eating chips at the top of the hill, not even aware of what's going on. Maybe that's, I don't know. But really, I want to be a dad like Joseph. I want to be in touch with God and do what it takes to care for my family and bring about the kingdom. As Joseph carried the kingdom around the Middle East. And so the call then, to me at least, is to be available to the ways that God is calling and inviting me to know him so that I might hear and respond as quickly or effortlessly as Joseph did. And as we tie this into the season of Epiphany, we have God communicating with Joseph. Maybe the first dream was at night, a peaceful night after the Magi were there. Maybe he's resting well. Probably not with a little kid around, if I know anything about that. But not all of these dreams and communications happen in the peaceful, restful times where things are always safe and snugly. But they happen in real life. In real life, we see God revealing himself to humanity before, with, and since Christ. Because God's character is to make himself known to us. God knows that God is love. And we are invited to experience that. So which way works for you? Joseph kind of found his groove with dreams. How does God reveal himself to you if God truly wants to be known? His true moments of epiphany are not moments that we direct. I know we use that term a lot. I had an epiphany. 
But a true moment of epiphany is where God is the one doing the epiphanying. God reveals God's self to us. God does the revealing. And God reveals himself to us always. And we celebrate it in this particular season, but it's always happening. And so the question stands, what are the ways that we can put ourselves in places to hear or sense or notice God? And this morning, I wanted to take some time, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about some of these ways. I'm going to take some of the language from a book called The Nine Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. And some of you have maybe heard of this and some of you haven't. This is a potential framework, not an exhaustive and definitely not a prescriptive list by any means. But I want to run through these a little bit because maybe there are any, any maybe there's anyone here who's never heard of these or heard of things like this to see this. And what's the point of any of this if I am not as a pastor providing ways for people to connect with and experience God in some way in their own lives? And so let's run through these. You don't have to, if you want to write them down, you can, but I can also give you, I can give you these in a printed form if you'd like, but I'll run through them quick because it's sort of like a Myers-Briggs uh, for ways you might be able to connect with God. First, naturalists connect to God best outdoors. Uh, people who would be sensates would connect through their senses, sights and sounds like art and music. Traditionalists would connect best through ritual and symbols and liturgy. Ascetics would connect to God in solitude and in simplicity. Activists connect best through confrontation, advocating for godly principles and values. And caregivers connect best to God just by serving others, by giving of themselves. Enthusiasts connect to God best through mystery and celebration, outward displays of passion. Contemplatives would connect best through their attentiveness and their deep attention, deep love and intimacy. And intellectuals would connect God best through their mind. Uh, through intense study, apologetics, and intellectual pursuits of their faith. If anyone has met Jeremy Duncan, this is great. It's just a great example. It's a great example. And maybe we ran through that list really quickly, and there were some of those that you were like, oh, that might be, that, that's, that's me sometimes. And that's good, because some of us are some of these things some of the time. And we're rarely just one of them. We're more likely to be a mix. And also as our lives ebb and flow and as we grow and as we change, how we connect and would resonate with God can change as well. So the call to us is to use them to put ourselves in places where God might be revealed to us. And as Hillary says, as I ran through these with her, she says, basically, do something if it works. And then also try new things. So that's kind of how she summed it up. And it's important to remember that Joseph hears these things as he is moving. He is on the journey. He's in the messiness and craziness of life. Not always just cozy and sitting by roasting chestnuts by the fire with a silent, safe baby Jesus. Similar to my experience in my neighborhood, I live in Silver Springs and in my neighborhood in the park, there is a prayer labyrinth that the community has put together. So I like to go there and just walk it sometimes because it's very peaceful. But a lot of times I have Frank with me. And so it's like trying to walk a prayer labyrinth when your son is chasing you and trying to run through the lines and chase you through the prayer labyrinth. Sometimes that's how it is for some of us to just try any type of way to connect with God. Life happens in the midst of those things. We need to remember that as we try any way to connect with God. That's also why we serve communion up here at the front instead of in our seats. We want to symbolize the journey. We want to give time 
for everyone to make their way up here. To consider where you are and where you are going as you move towards this encounter with the living God. And this beautiful revelation moment where God reveals himself in communion, the sacrament of the Eucharist, the mystery where on one hand we simply eat bread that's been dipped in some juice, and yet God is present with us, is an epiphany moment for us together. And so as you come down, I invite you to come down the center aisle uh, to either side of the stage, grab a piece of bread or a cracker, uh, dip it in the cup, and then return to your seats down the aisles, symbolizing on a small but not insignificant scale your journey to encounter God up here in this moment amongst this community. So all are welcome. Please come.